Hi there, my name is Memo, this is my channel House Planty Goodness and essentially it's a place where I like to geek out about my big passion. Today's video is going to be a bit different. So on Instagram and on here actually in the communities area of my channel I asked you all to send in some questions and I thought I'd do my first ever Q&A on this channel. Just as a warning this might be a relatively long video so hopefully you can deal through going through all the questions, but feel free to skip to bits that you might be interested in. Right, into the questions. And the first set of questions I'm going to go through are the ones from Instagram. If you're not following me already on Instagram, the links are down below in the description. Do follow along there. I tend to be a bit more active when it comes to responding on Instagram because I check that daily. With the YouTube videos, some of you might have noticed, I'll, as soon as the video is up, I'll probably answer and kind of engage a bit more with the comments for that new video for the first 24 hours to the first week, basically. So if you have got a burning question to ask, probably tag along onto Instagram, follow me on there, and let's have a conversation on there. Right, back to the questions. First question was a bit of a more challenging one. And somebody on Instagram was asking, are the plants that we buy locally propagated or are we potentially all contributing to habitat loss? <laughs> uh, talk about starting with a difficult question. This is a tricky one to answer and I can only give my opinion on this. I'm not an expert by any stretch of the imagination, but the one thing I would say, it's highly dependent on where you are and where you're buying from. I would highly encourage you, I actually am friends with quite a few of the local sellers, at least here, and a lot of people within the community. And this has been a conversation that's been had for a while now. Now, the interesting thing, and I'm piggybacking off something that Kaylee Ellen said on her channel as well, a lot of the plants that are in the market and that have been in the market for years, have at one point or another been created through tissue culture. And tissue culture isn't necessarily taking plants out of the environment or out of their habitats, it is kind of creating new material from the plants you've already got. My question to that is always a bit more of a critical one, is are those original plants taken out of habitat? That I don't know. But what I encourage you to do specifically with the seller or the establishment that you're buying from, ask them. A lot of the times they would have done at least some form of due diligence and they would have talk to their growers, their suppliers, to see where they get their plants from. A lot of the time when you're buying from individuals online, I'm thinking eBay, Etsy, all of these things, generally speaking, if they're just a kind of somebody who's got a collection like myself and they're just propagating and selling that on, you should be relatively safe in assuming that at least the plant that you're getting hasn't been taken from a habitat. And that's, that's a slightly sticky thing there. It could be that if somebody's bought a plant from abroad and it was shipped directly from say Indonesia or something like that, you don't know where that original plant, possibly the parent of your rooted cutting has come from. Feel free to ask those individual sellers, they themselves might not know. So hopefully that answers the question, but it's a bit of a tricky one essentially. But um, generally speaking, ask. That's the best thing that you can do essentially. I do have another video that I was talking a bit more about kind of taking plants out of their habitat and anything that we might be causing in terms of that. And I'll try to link it up in the corner there as well. Right, moving on to the next question. <laughs> I like the next question. So again, somebody from Instagram is asking how long on average each day do I spend caring, checking, admiring the plants in my collection? And this is a relatively straightforward answer, actually. On an average weekday, <laughs> on an average weekday, it depends. It could be as little as 45 minutes just to care for the plants. It could be up to two hours sometimes. It depends. Because the way that I will care for my plants is I use my Plant Care Reminder app. And again, I'll link a video that I did about that at the top there. And I've got all of my plants on there. It's got 
when I need to water, and again, I've touched on this before when it comes to schedules, I don't believe in watering on a schedule. The schedule that I've got on that app is to get me to check and see if that plant needs watering. If it does, then water. The app has a really cool little feature that I can also delay watering or fertilizing or spraying for pests or even rotating the plant around by however many days I might need. So I use that as a basis, but yeah, essentially, 45 minutes to two hours, depending on most weekdays. And I'll answer the question that you're probably already thinking. I will usually do that first thing in the morning whilst I'm having my coffee, I'll plug in some headphones. I'm a huge fan of listening to audiobooks. So I'll listen to my audiobook and I'll go around and care for my plants. <laughs> on the weekends, it's a different story because I've been able to kind of some plants that are very routine in when they need their care and the slightly heavier things. So for instance, if I'm doing anything like a repot, anything like that, I will try to schedule it in for the weekend, even pest control to a certain point. For weekends, it could be anything from two hours to some days, four hours. <laughs> and these time frames will change depending on the time of the year. <laughs> Spring and summer when it's a bit warmer, especially in the conservatory because there's a lot more light. There's a lot more plants that need watering. So we're coming into the difficult time of the year in terms of how much time I spend in here. But the reality is I don't find it difficult. That I still enjoy caring for my plants and it's still a Zen moment for me, essentially. So as I said, it's one of the few times where I can kind of block out the entirety of the rest of the world and just take care of my plants. I'm a person who really does appreciate kind of routine and habits, and that's very kind of soothing to my stress levels and my anxiety levels. So I do kind of enjoy doing that. Is it a bit much at the moment? Possibly. Um, moving on to the next one. I have got, again, somebody from Instagram asking, do I use nematodes? What the best way is to use them? And how generally I will kind of use them in my collection. Now, in terms of nematodes, and I know there's different types of nematodes, I've only used one type of nematode so far in my collection, and I don't know how much of it I'm gonna use this year, purely because I've moved a lot of my plants into pond. But the nematodes that I was using, so beneficial nematodes for those who don't know, are essentially organisms, usually they are microscopic worms, at least the ones that I'm thinking of, and they act as predators usually within the soil. So it's usually a kind of cakey powder, at least the one that I was using. And the one that I use is the one for fungus gnats. So all the little annoying, what people assume are fruit flies that are flying around their plants basically. And what those little organisms do is those little worms go into the larva or the eggs of the fungus gnats and they basically eat them from the inside. <laughs> um, but, and again, I will say this because I think this came up with as another question directly to me on Instagram where somebody was saying, oh, they're, they're struggling a bit with nematodes um, and it wasn't working as well as it did with fungus gnats. What I tended to do and it worked really well for me is I did the soil drench on all of my plants at the same time and I also got some of the sticky traps as well, because essentially what the nematodes will do is it will kill the larva in the soil. But if you've still got quite a few of the adults, because the adults are the ones that are flying around, still around, and they <laughs> procreate and create more larva, and it's a few weeks later, you might then get a new set of larva in the soil after the nematodes have done the job with the ones that were already existing on there as well. The other thing I will say about nematodes is at least, and I don't know how scientific this is, they usually, you buy them online, they come over in the mail, you can, the ones that I'm thinking that I've used, you can keep them for a day or two in the fridge. I don't, I try to use them as soon as I get them in. But also there is a concept that if you keep them cold for too long, those nematodes could also die. So I'm thinking in the UK where I am, I wouldn't be wanting to order those when the weather is still quite cool because if they get stuck in the post or anything like that, 
there is a chance by the time you get the nematodes and you can't see them, they're not like other predators that you can kind of see moving around sometimes, you might just be drenching the soil with dead nematodes because they've died in transit because it might have been too cold or anything like that. So I generally try to use my nematodes when the weather order and use my nematodes when the weather is starting to get a bit warmer. So generally here I will tend to do that around May time. If I see that the infestation doesn't go away um, soon enough, and by soon enough I was quite surprised when I first used it, you will still have fungus gnats even with the fly traps and the nematodes for a couple of weeks, probably more than just a couple of weeks after you've drenched it, but then all of a sudden like a month or so after, you'll kind of look around and go, oh, there's no fungus gnats. It's because they're all dead. But uh, but yeah, just bear that in mind. That's when I will usually use nematodes and that's the way that I would use the nematodes. Right, let's go on to the next one. The next one is a cool question actually and it's, um, it's an interesting one because this individual asks, how do I prevent from getting overwhelmed by plant chores? He says that my collection is amazing, thank you. <laughs> But um, yeah, it can be overwhelming at times. And I'm not going to lie, I've been doing this for long enough. And I think of those of us out there that have got big collections. And by the way, that is completely unique to you where your biting point is for big collections. I know a few people that have got thousands of plants in their collection and they don't think it's too much. I've, I know people that have got 10 plants or 20 plants in their collection and they think that's too much. So it's up to you <laughs> where you draw the line basically. But I'm kind of, I think at the edges of mine at this point in time, I think I will be doing a kind of plant purge and getting rid of some of my smaller plants. The ones that are not giving me joy, but there's a lot of people that they could be giving joy to and just to give a bit more space because I'm kind of at the stage now where I'm enjoying some of my plants that are getting large and I would like them to be larger. But if I've got large, loads of large plants and loads of small plants, it can get a bit much at times. I don't let it overwhelm me too much. I also take steps to kind of curb that before it happens. So for instance, one of the reasons why I move a lot of my plants into pond is the potential of being able to have most of my plants in self-watering for this summer because after last summer, which was the first summer of these plants being in a conservatory and they're getting all the lovely light and the warmth and all the humidity, watering was insane. It took large chunks of the day. I think there was a couple of really, really warm and sunny days where I would spend two hours watering in the morning on that day to spend another two hours watering in the evening. That got a bit much for me. So I thought, let's kind of do something about it so that next summer, maybe it's not as much of an issue. So that's why pond and that's why slowly transitioning my plants into self-watering. So at least it's a bit more manageable in the summer months. Uh, of course, there was going to be a question about thrips. <laughs> so the question is, what can I do against thrips? I can't get rid of them with just cleaning. I hate to be the bearer of bad news. And again, I'm only talking about my experiences. If other people have had good experiences with just cleaning the thrips off their plants, do drop a comment down below. I would like to know this as much as this person probably would. But with thrips and hopefully some people that have been around for a while and have been dealing with it can corroborate this. I tried a lot of different things. I tried the soap and water rinse. I tried blasting them with just water. I also tried neem spray and I found that most of these things didn't work. And the only thing that worked for me was the systemic spray. It's not for everybody. People don't always necessarily want to use that, especially uh, because it might cause issues for some of the local um, bug population essentially, so bees and stuff like that. Granted, there is there is a debate there on if you're spraying indoors and not outdoors, you generally don't get bees indoors. Is it causing that much of an issue? I don't know, I'm not an expert. Uh, there might be issues with pets and things like that, so it's up to you, but unfortunately for me, the only thing that has worked is systemic, and I'm not gonna sit here and lie and pretend I don't use it. I do use it only for thrips though. And the difference in kind of 
stress levels and efficiency that I get from the systemic is night and day, basically. When I was doing things like neem oil and everything else, it would be weekly spray and months down the line and nothing had really changed. I hadn't really made much of a chink in the bug's kind of life cycle and it was still, and I've got a lot of plants and they are very, very close to each other. So standard uh, pests like mealybugs can move between my plants. Imagine things like thrips that can fly between plants that I could get a really quick infestation from just one plant having them to my entire collection and then that would be an issue basically. So I need to get ahead of the ball there really quickly. That's why I would use the systemic. The difference then becomes with most, with the systemic that I use, and if I'm not mistaken, it is Provanto in the UK. I think it's linked in the description down below, uh, or I will link it in the description if I can find it. There are other ones that might be slightly better, I know, in the US, but uh, we can't buy those ones in the UK. So Provanto is the one that I use. There is something to be said about the systemic that after a while, the bugs can develop a tolerance to it. So it's still not 100% guaranteed that it's going to work. But the difference with using that systemic is that I spray it on first sighting. I'm a lot better at kind of spotting and looking at my plants really quickly to see if I can see thrips at a larval stage. And there's been one or two times when I've seen thrips at a larval stage and I blitz it immediately. Uh, I don't delay because that can get out of control really quickly. And after I blitz it the first time, so basically fully spray down the entire plant until the leaves are dripping, I will do that again in two weeks time. And hopefully by that point it's done. If not, just as a fail safe, I'll do it again in two weeks after that. So three applications, two weeks apart. And generally that worked. After months of trying something else, that was the only thing that worked. But yeah, hopefully that answers the question. Next question is about fertilizer. So somebody was asking, when would you want a balanced fertilizer and when would you not want a balanced fertilizer? It's a good question. Uh, with liquid gold leaf, which is the one that I use pretty much exclusively for most of my collection at the moment, I don't think it's fully balanced, but it is meant to be for foliar plants. So that's the one thing you need to ask yourself in terms of that question. And when do you want a balanced fertilizer? When do you not want a balanced fertilizer? A balanced fertilizer will be a good all rounder. You can probably use it for most situations and it will be fine. That's why it's a balanced fertilizer essentially. If you kind of really want to soup up your game with a lot of houseplants that are foliar plants, the majority of houseplants that we're all growing, we tend to grow them for their foliage rather than blooms. Then you would want something that isn't a balanced fertilizer, but that maybe would have a higher end value and nitrogen value essentially. And sometimes you might not even need to look at that necessarily. They might even be promoting that fertilizer as a foliar promotion uh, rather than a bloom boost, basically. So usually the, the unbalanced fertilizer, the non-balanced fertilizer, which is meant to be for blooms, will say that it's a bloom boost. And I do have that one as well. I, <laughs> in the UK, I use the Baby Bio Orchid one because it's, it's better at promoting blooms. And I will use that not only on my orchids every time I water it in a very, very weak solution, but for my plants that bloom. So for instance, my stephanotis, the hibiscus, some of the hoyas. But interestingly, last summer I tried something different because I always used to switch over from kind of my standard liquid gold leaf fertilizer that I fertilize with for the rest of the year to that orchid bloom boost in the summer when I would see that my plants were getting ready, all the ones that I just mentioned were getting ready to bloom. And this year I decided not to do that. I stayed on the liquid gold leaf and interestingly, I had more success that way. So it's up to you really on what you wanna try. As with most of these things, I always encourage you to try both. If Financially, you can buy both. Try both and see what works for you with the care that you give your plants in your environment, basically. But yeah, that's that's the answer for what I use. <laughs> ah, we're starting to get into some juicy questions now. Uh, and this might be a controversial one. Hopefully the rest of the plants won't listen to this one. But one of the questions is, 
what I think is one of the most underrated plants. And instead of me just talking about it, let me pick it up and show you. So the plant that I think is massively underrated, and this might surprise people that I'm picking up a begonia. So I'll bring it in a bit closer so you might be able to see. Apologies for how janky some of the leaves are, but you can see quite how large that begonia leaf is in relation to my head. But uh, hopefully that might pick up some of the detailing and don't judge me on the dust level on the plants. But you might be able to see, yes, you can see some of the hairs. This is a begonia seismorii. And let me bring in some, one of the newest leaf and you can see there. And for the people that are true OGs and they've been here for a while, this is also one of the few plants that I have given a pet name to. This is Chewy, as in Chewbacca. <laughs> because of the hairiness, obviously. Uh, interesting enough, this is my mother plant. The baby propagation plant you might be able to see behind me in there. I'm not picking that up because that's going to probably destroy most of the plant, me trying to get it out. But that is probably about three times the size of this. And the leaves are about three times the size of this largest leaf here. So, <laughs> but definitely an underrated plant. You don't get it very often. It's not technically rare, but it's just not that many people know of it. I saw there was a point a few months ago, at least in the UK, when it came into the market a bit more strongly. So yeah, this for me is definitely one of the underrated plants. More traditional kind of plants I think that people might see more regularly in kind of plant stores and plant nurseries. I will pick one up and show you. And this might not come as a surprise to many people, but the Marble Queen Epipremnum for me is definitely a bit of an underrated one. I mean, look at the levels of irrigation on that plant. I am a sucker for some really good irrigation. And this is a bit more readily available. Usually you can find this in some plant stores. Um, but yeah, I think this is, this is one that I would say most underrated in terms of relatively common plants. And I'll show you one philodendron as well. The other underrated one that I wanted to show in terms of a philodendron, and I'll bring this in a bit closer so you might be able to see. These are the newest leaves. The smaller leaves are down here. That's kind of more traditional what you'd get. This is the philodendron eximium. Eximium, I'll see if I can put the name up in the corner there. Very, very cool plant. This is one that you might want to do a quick Google search to see what the mature form looks like, but it's very cool. Okay, moving on. And I'm going to bulk a few questions together because they're all kind of closely related. So one of the questions is, if you could only have one plant, which one would it be? <laughs> I don't think this might be surprised for most people. Pride of Joy, the Philodendron Esmeraldense. It is large, it is in charge, and that's not even the largest leaf. Let me see if I can tilt you around so you can see the largest leaf, which is right up there. This is the largest leaf, which is even larger than that one. <laughs> right, let me move you back. And moving on again in relation to the Esmeral Dense, there was as I said, a few questions. So there's people that were asking what plant was that one in the back. That is the Philodendron Esmeraldense. Watch out in the following few weeks because for the people that are following along for the plant review series, I'll be doing my review on the Esmeraldense soon as well. But let's have a look at some of the other questions. So the first question that I got about the Esmeraldense is how big was it when I first got it? And I can show you actually, let me, there was one of the oldest leaves, I don't think this was one of its original leaves, so it would have been a bit smaller. It has literally just crisped up and died because making room for a brand new, this might not be picking up too closely, but there's a brand new leaf that's getting ready to unfurl and it's very exciting. Right, let me show you the old leaf and I'll show you roughly what the size was in relation to when I first got it. So old leaf, just a bit of a head test so you can see it's it was relatively kind of sizable it wasn't quite this large it was probably only about that big i would say maybe a bit thinner obviously as well this is a more mature leaf but it, i did get it with relatively mature leaves and it continued that way as well and i'm just going to drop it on the floor because i need to deal with that in a minute 
But yeah, it was relatively large, but it has sized up considerably since then, basically, as well. I almost, funny story, when I moved to this property, moved around February time, it was arctically cold, and the heating wasn't up to scratch in here. I'd put this in, as well as the majority of my other plants, I hadn't realized that the temperature dropped as much as it did during the night time in here. This and my Calathea orbifolia, the two only plants that got cold damage. I cannot tell you how much I was stressing around that time, but I kind of kept calm from what I could see from other people's stories in terms of cold damage and the plant weathered through it. Um, but there's a few other questions. Let me pick up the iPad so I can see. Did I struggle to acclimate it? Not particularly. It's a shame because the person that's asking the question is saying that they they got one, it hated them, and it died a tragic death, which is such a shame. It's interesting that is a story with that one because I would actually have to say that my Esmeralda Dense, for me at least, and not just in the conservatory because I used to have it in a different location in the previous property when I was first growing it, is possibly one of my easiest philodendron. If not the easiest, no, I think the easiest I'm looking at, my, my Burley Marks Variegata, that's my easiest and less fussy one, but not far off. I didn't do anything kind of special to it. I had it in my very, very chunky Aroid soil mix in terracotta. I always, with that one, pretty much let it go almost fully, fully dry, and then I would water it, but I would water it very deeply and it gets fertilized weekly every time it gets uh, watered and it's been fine. I've not, I mean obviously in here there's high humidity but it didn't get any special treatment when I first got it so light, light is a big one for it basically. As much light as you can give it and it will keep kind of growing and be happy and grow bigger leaves as well. Um, but no real struggles otherwise, unfortunately. Well, fortunately, depending on how you look at it. Um, moving on swiftly, I think that's everything I wanted to talk about, the Esmeralda Dense. I'll go into more detail in the review, because uh, I'm aware that this video is probably going to be a bit of a long one. I do apologise, but hopefully I can answer all of your questions. If I see that this is getting too, too long, I might have to split the Q&A into two questions because I'm still on the Instagram questions. I haven't even moved on to the questions that the YouTube community has answered. So, <laughs> but um, I'll answer the next one quite quickly. How to make a ZZ plant grow longer and faster. <laughs> ah, the nervous laugh. Um, I don't know, you tell me. <laughs> For the people that have been here long enough, they might realize this, and this is something that applies to the majority of my life, not just with plants. The easy things that everybody else assumes are easy are the things that I struggle with the most. The things that are difficult for most other people, I tend to do okay with. I don't know. Um, I have never been able to keep ZZ plants happy or living for very long. And I know it's the whole kind of notion if you're watering your ZZ plant, more often than you're paying your mortgage or you're paying your rent, you're watering it too frequently. I learned that one the hard way. Um, I think my ZZ plants now get watered every month or every month and a half. Um, but I don't know. I'm not an expert with ZZ plants. As I said, I've not been able to keep either the standard one or the Raven one particularly happy. I've given it lower light levels. I've given it medium light levels. I've given it brighter light levels. Nothing is making it happy. I don't know is the answer to that question. <laughs> so a question that came up about alocasia is, if an alocasia is getting droopy leaves, do you cut them off? If so, when, or do you just let them be? Now, interestingly, yes, I cut them off sometimes, but I will kind of let most plants that have got, especially things like alocasia, that I've got big, big leaves, I will kind of let most plants, especially the ones with the big leaves, to go fully yellow, droop, and ideally start crisping up before I get rid of it, because essentially those sugars from that leaf are kind of reabsorbing back into the plant. If it's a relatively well-established plant, then 
I would probably cut it off. As I keep saying on my channel, I'm not that bothered about aesthetic. Plants in nature aren't perfect. I don't want to be going out of my way in my household to make them perfect. Granted, that applies more to my conservatory because I'm the one that sees this most of the time. It's my crazy jungle. Some of the plants in kind of more prominent places in the house where there might be guests coming around and things like that, I might try to keep those a bit more pristine, but even then, uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't need my plants or my living environment to be perfect because guess what? Life isn't perfect, so it's fine. I'm happy for them to have their flaws. But with droopy leaves, I would leave it. By the way, this is just what I would do. I'm not saying that you should either decide what's best for you. It won't necessarily harm them. The one thing I will say about droopy leaves or yellowing leaves more specifically, do check them sometimes because those kind of leaves that are dying off might be pest magnets as well. In terms of droopy leaves for alocasia, and I know this is a question that has come up before, I don't know if I've ever really had any success with standard green leaves that might be drooping for other reasons other than the fact that they're just going to die soon and go yellow and die off. I don't know whether or not I've ever been able to get an alocasia leaf to straighten back up again, if that makes sense. I think if they droop, they're drooped, basically. That's kind of where you are. Mm, correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, but I think that's kind of where I, I kind of sit with that one. Another question that came up is a social media plant favorite that you don't see the hype in, I think. I can't see the whole question when I took the screenshot. Some of it was getting cut off. I think that's what the question says. For me, it's a tricky one. There's a lot of plants that have got social media hype around them that I kind of don't see what it's all about. Um, I think it's less about the plant itself and sometimes about the pricing that goes with it. So, for instance, the Adansonia, the variegated Adansonii, I like the Adansonii. I don't mind the look of the variegated Adansonii. I don't understand the pricing for it because... And obviously that's what we're seeing now with the prices dropping as quickly as they are because Adansonias grow like weeds. Why they're that expensive? Same thing goes for something like a variegated um, Raphidophora tetrasperma, for instance. That's all over. That one does look a bit more interesting. The prices are insane for a plant, again, that the green version, and I would assume to a certain point, the variegated version grows like a weed. But less about the fact yeah, I think I'm still maybe one of those weird people that, yes, I do have some quote-unquote rare plants in my collection. But I'm still, I think at least the way that I choose plants is because I personally like the look of them rather than the fact that everybody likes the look of them. I've got plants in here that most people wouldn't necessarily go out of their ways to get. So I've got the Sephora prostrata, which is the, the baby leaf little plant and I'll see if I can pick it up and show you. So this is the Sephora Prostrata and it's tiny and it grows really weird and it's really delicate but this isn't one that there's a social media hype about I don't think but I liked it so I went and got it and I'm still very much the same with most of the plants in my collection. If I like it I will get it because I like the look of that plant. I'll caveat that and say I want to see if I can actually care for that plant in my environment. But yeah, I don't tend to get behind the hype too much, I don't think. So the next question is, which plant or plants do I regret buying? Now, a few ones that come to mind is, and I've got whatever's left of it up there, and sometimes people ask me about the pinkish leaves. It's the... So this is Discolor. <laughs> Got a huge plant of that that died a uh, slow and painful death. And I know some people have had successes with it. It's not one for me. I regret getting that. Um, the Skindapsis Moonshine. I like it. I'm coming around to it now a bit more when it's getting a bit more bigger and fuller. But it is a mealybug magnet. There was issues possibly one of the most painfully slow growing plants in my collection. That's one as well. And one that might surprise people, 
the varicosum, the philodendron varicosum, knowing what I know now, I don't think I would have ever purchased it, basically, for many reasons. But again, I'm probably going to do a review on that at some point, and <laughs> you can see my opinions about that plant then. Right, one of the last few questions from Instagram is, do I isolate any new plants when I bring them in, or do I treat them when I bring them in? I know what I should say here, <laughs> but the reality is, no. <laughs> it depends. I mean, it does depend. If I'm getting the plant from somewhere, and actually I was going to say from somewhere that I don't know, but even places that I do know, if I look at it and I think mm, it's a bit sketch, it might have some bugs, it might have some issues, I would still probably treat it by just giving it... Um, and this is the interesting thing as well, I would probably just give it a spray down. I've got one of those taps in the kitchen sink that's got like a um, shower nozzle head thing. So I'll spray the leaves down and everything like that, uh, just to make sure if there's any pests that they get knocked down. I'll kind of look at the plant in more detail. But that is pretty much all I would do. It would go straight into the collection. And yes, I know that that's not what you should be doing because you can be introducing pathogens or pests straight into a collection problem that I have with the sheer volume of plants that I have and somebody else asked how many plants have I got I'd need to check my app but I think I'm over four or five hundred plants I would say at this point I might be wrong and I'm not counting every single one of the propagations there's probably about a good hundred or two hundred propagations going as well <laughs> ah, fun times um, but um, with yeah, so normally I wouldn't necessarily do anything different to them. And ironic enough, and I've said this on a previous video, a lot of the times, depending on the plant, if I see that the soil that it's in that's coming in from the shop or the nursery isn't good, I will instantly repot. And I know it's not something that a lot of people recommend, but my line of thinking behind that is the plant is stressed because you're moving it into a new location. I'll stress it a bit more by changing the soil at the same time. Yes, it could kill your plant. Don't know the risks going into this. But my thinking is, I can, it's stressed when it's coming in here, I can let it acclimate for a couple of weeks and then re-stress it again to get it into better soil. Also, if the soil isn't good for my conditions and I bring it in, it's going to be acclimating, it's probably going to get stressed if the soil isn't good because it's going to be fighting it against a lot of other things. I just think, get all the stress for the plant done in one. And I said, it could be too much for the plant, but... My experience hasn't been that. It's kind of been okay for most of the times. Um, and then just let it kind of do its thing, really. And by changing the soil a lot of the times, any kind of soil kind of living bugs or pathogens are also kind of getting left away. The one thing I will say about soil, specifically if I'm changing the entire soil of the plant, I will usually leave a bit of the soil that it came with just to make that transition over not as shocking because it's kind of used to the soil that it's in already so i'll give it some of that as a as a safety blanket i have definitely gone on for way too long in this video um i will say hopefully the majority of you have stuck around the whole way through if not i do understand it's a slightly longer video but yeah if you've got any questions comments do drop them down below. I'll leave the community question open on my channel for more questions because keep those questions coming on that and I can make this a bit more of a regular thing and maybe make them a bit shorter. Like every so often I'll do a, uh, a questions and answers video where I can kind of go through some of the most pressing questions that you guys all have. But yeah, hopefully you've enjoyed. Hopefully I shall see you here soon and I truly, truly hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye.